So tonight we have, we're um, very lucky, the um, Roaring Fork Audubon was able to bring David Leatherman to us from Fort Collins. And he has, um, he's originally from Ohio. He's been interested in nature since a child, much like many of us, I'm imagining. Um, some of his early mentors included Dr. Edward Thomas and Milton Trotman. Um, he has a bio biology degree from Marietta College in Ohio and also a master's in forestry from Duke University. Um, he's, he's actually an entomologist, um, so someone who studies bugs, and he's been spent a lot of his career working for the Colorado State Forest Service and where he was responsible for the mountain pine beetle projects. He did a fair amount of teaching and a fair amount of surveys as well. Now, for those of you who are birders in the room, we'll definitely uh, really appreciate these fun factoids. Um, he has seen over 446 species in this state of Colorado, and he's been part of finding three first state records here in our state. He's contributed a few thousand insect specimens, that's a few thousand insect specimens to the CSU Gillette Museum annually. Um, he has a family with children and grandchildren, and really cool, all the photos in the presentation tonight are his photos. So he's also quite the photographer. And um, he, his favorite bird, apparently, is the black Bernian warbler. Anybody else know what that is? Yeah, OK. Good, good. Um, and his, he, he's, most, he's now retired from the State Forest Service, but he spends some time contributing um, to his column in the journal called Colorado Birds. And it's called the Hungry Bird column. And so without further ado, thank you, David, for coming. And I'll get the slides here going. showing up. I uh, appreciate the uh, Wilderness Workshop and ACES and uh, Rocky Fork Audubon for putting this together. And you have to push enter okay. to make it, or the arrows, to make them change. Okay, thank you. And I thank Sarah for setting me up. Everybody hear this? Can you hear it? Okay. And uh, my man, Shep Harris, has been a, he's a great guy to stay with if you ever want to stay with somebody. <laughs> um, guy, guy knows how to do it. So stand up closer so they can see you in the, in the video. Okay, all right. So um, I'm very pleased to see the crowd and especially these little ones here. And uh, so I uh, grew up interested in birds and bugs and I found, I got a job in bugs. Uh, <laughs> I still was interested in birds, and I came home from most of my work days in the field with a headache because I had one eye up and one eye down. And, um, but uh, when I retired, I could really concentrate on something that started intriguing me. Oh, probably in the late 1980s, I really started paying attention to these uh, combinations of things I saw. That bird ate that particular insect, which I knew what it was, and most of, most of these are tree things. And, uh, the subject of what birds eat has kind of grown into a, an obsession, I guess you could say. And my ex-wife used to say that was the way we're going to die, is uh, <laughs> pulling over on the interstate to see what kind of <laughs> roadkill that raven was eating on or what, what type of Taco Bell it was chewing on or whatever. And, um, yeah, that's not the only reason. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's it's an obsession now, and uh, when I die, it will be only regretful because I didn't get to see all the combinations. But uh, um, you know, most of what we know. The thing I like about this subject is that there are things that everybody in here, if you're at all interested in birds, can contribute that is new information for the planet, that we don't know that birds eat that, at least not on Tuesday, uh, with a cold front coming. Or I mean, there, there's a lot of things we don't know about what birds eat. And uh, you would think we would know that by now, but we don't. And that's because most birders are birders and not true bird watchers. They 
A lot of birders are what I would call outdoor stamp collectors, and they're really good at racking them up and moving on to the next one. <laughs> but if you ask them, how does that bird live its life? Eh, not that interesting, or then, I don't know, because I've never spent more than five minutes with it. Once I saw it and identified it, I'm on to the next one. So I, I think birding is, should be way more than just what is it. And um, uh, anyway, um, I better get going on this because I'll never get finished. Sarah's going to give me 10 minutes and I'll be on slide 24. Um, <laughs> is that right? No? Okay. So, um, I'm not going to ask you what kind of bird this is, but uh, pretty much everything birds do is for two reasons. Um, <laughs> Sex and food, and uh, unfortunately, this talks about food. Um, but this is the uh, digestive system of a bird, which isn't all that different than ours. Uh, but it's got, there's a few exceptions. They have a thing called a crop. And if you've ever seen a uh, hawk with a very fat looking chest, it's because it just ate something and it's kind of storing it in that first. Uh, first compartment of its digestive tract and they have a thing called a proventriculus and um, tomorrow I have to go get up early and go to the top of the gondola at Aspen Mountain and do a thing for Aspen 82 television. Mm -hmm. So it's the X Games and I've seen some of the other uh, recordings that they've done of other speakers in the series and I know that the guy who's going to be interviewing me is kind of a Hugh Masekela kind of guy that's you know used to interviewing Sean White doing a triple <laughs> triple whirly bird blah blah and I got to make what birds eat interesting to this dude and so I was wondering if you could use uh, Proventriculus and gnarly in the same sentence. And, uh, I'm, I'm going to try it tomorrow, but anyway. Uh, so eventually, this stuff is working its way down to the stomach where it will be digested, and all these other things ahead of that are kind of pre grinded up, start introducing chemicals and uh, kind of precursors to the real digestion and absorption of materials. But um, so, you know, chime's a good word to remember for uh, Scrabble or something, but that's just kind of the mash that if birds burp, that's what they would burp up. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, bird metabolism is faster than ours. Their uh, body temperatures are higher than ours. And uh, I say it's faster, it's, it's real fast in some cases, and I my evidence of this is getting out of my car one time when I was going to our district office in Canyon City, bird dropping on top of my car and a worm was wiggling in the bird dropping. And I thought, man, this bird's got a problem. Uh, but bird, you know, stuff goes through a bird very fast and they have to eat a lot of food compared to us for their body weight. Um, so this is kind of a typical uh, day in the life of a songbird, these percentages of time spent doing different activities. And you can see that foraging for food is like a third of their day. Uh, luckily, we don't have to do that anymore. I suppose the settlers did have to do that, and the Native Americans had to spend probably more than that uh, getting food. But um, that's just a... So this mockingbird, an average sized bird, robin sized bird, maybe needs 30 calories a day to uh, sustain itself. Uh, so to feed a mockingbird, uh, one happy meal would feed a mockingbird for 10 days. So don't eat happy meals. <laughs> You'll get real fat. Uh, but these are typical uh, amounts, calories per day for some different birds. So those red-tailed hawks that you see all over the Roaring Fork Valley, maybe 150 calories a day is what they need. That little ruby crown kinglet only needs less than 10. But try to, try to amass 10 calories eating aphids. Uh, um, 
so, you know, I, I maintain that if you are good at understanding what birds eat, you will be a better naturalist, a better observer, a better bird watcher for a lot of reasons. And all of us, once you get a reputation that you're the kind of a bird expert locally on your block or whatever, you will have to lead a field trip. And you'll figure out if you're a leader, you got to show the troops something. And if you can figure out where these bird, where the bird feeders are in your neighborhood or where the some natural uh, congregating point for food things, those are the best places to show people that you want to show uh, animals to. And, and, uh, but I, you know, I think it should be more than that. You, you, we understand them, we're better at conserving them, we're better at advocating for them if we know how they live their lives. Uh, so you can learn a lot, you can guess a lot about what a bird eats just by looking at its bill or its beak. And uh, some of them you can, some of them you can't. You probably couldn't guess that that puffin in the lower left uh, catches slippery, skinny fish by looking at that clown bill. Wow. But, uh, and you could probably guess the long-billed curlew in the upper left is doing something probing in the sand, actually that bill is probably most useful to where they breed in tall grass and they can actually get grasshoppers down in two foot tall grass with that, you remember the uh, movie Karate Kid and Miyagi that could catch a fly with chopsticks? That's kind of what they're doing with that, with that bill. I mean, you could guess the black-headed grosbeak in the upper right is crunching hard seeds the hawk is ripping some kind of flesh with that beak. Uh, the crossbill down there in the middle, it's got his uh, Swiss Army knife on his face, and he's using that bill that looks like he flew into a wall to extract seeds from conifer cones very well, I might add. The hummingbird's sticking his little beak down tubular flowers, and the goose is straining things out of uh, aquatic plants. Uh, but these are some major uh, food groups that, remember that when we were growing up, they had the building block, the <laughs> nutritional building blocks and all that stuff. Well, this, these would be the foundation of uh, many, many bird diets, these groups, and uh, they're all important. But uh, among the, the insect groups, and insects are very, very critical to almost all birds, especially the ones that are here in the summertime, a uh, very high percentage of their diet is insects. Um, these major groupings are some that we'll go through here real quick. Um, but I talked about this, I did a, a field trip for Roaring Fork last summer and we talked about this concept of the way birds find their food is by looking for defect. Because they know that where there's a hole in a leaf, there's probably the maker of that hole, there's a caterpillar. And so you start looking at the environment like a bird would look at it and you're looking for things that aren't normal. You're looking for brown needles on a pine tree, one branch that's all brown. Well, that's a dead branch, and what kills the dead branch? Bark beetles and wood boring insects. So if you're a hairy woodpecker or a three-toed woodpecker, you would remove the bark on the brown branch to find what killed that branch. Uh, the holes in the top picture made by a leafcutter bee, uh, these folded uh, origami kind of things, leaves that are, look abnormally folded and held together with silk. There's something inside those things that, that, is, that formed a little house around itself, probably a caterpillar, and they tear those apart and get them out. The brown blotch on that cottonwood leaf is a, is a leaf mine, and there's an insect that tunnels around between the upper and lower layers of the leaf to make the mine, and it's in there, and birds, if you can figure out how to peel that off, there's a larva in there. Um, so this is an insect you probably have seen if you have flowers, these, these so-called hummingbird moths that hover at your petunias at dusk and they, you can barely see them. They, they look like a hummingbird and probably more common at lower elevation than the Roaring Fork Valley. But uh, the larvae of this white-lined sphinx moth uh, is this 
creature here. There's two color phases, black and green, and they have a little horn on the back. So it's a that the that group of moths. The larvae are called horn worms, like the tomato horn worm that you probably know, and that's a distinctive little thing. And a lot of birds eat those. They're big. It's a you know to a bird that's a a hoagie walking down the street and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here's a Sace Phoebe eating one of the moths and two different uh, McCown's long spur out on the Pawnee grasslands eating a, a larva and then a house sparrow. And that house sparrow, uh, if you ever see a bird eat a caterpillar, they, it's pretty violent and they throp it around and beat the <laughs> heck out of it. And, it, and then they seem to go way further, you know? It's like, uh, well, I'm not gonna say it. Um, they, they go way beyond what it looks like they need to do to subdue this prey, and that is because a lot of these things, after they're, they, they have bad juice in them. They have accumulated toxins, uh, alkaloids, and so on from the plant that they were eating, and the birds know that, and sometimes these things are stored up in pouches and around the mouth of the caterpillar, and if they can really throp that thing, they can get the bad juice out of there and then they can eat the, the sausage casing after they've gotten rid of the, the bad stuff. And, um, uh, you know, dragonflies and damselflies, odonata or odes, are common food for a lot of birds. Um, if you hang out by a pond with dragonflies, you will eventually see birds that, that key in on, if I'm a, a Dragonfly collector, what do I do? I stand there and I watch this one patrols up and back and up and back and I get the pattern that it's doing and I wait to time my swing that when it's coming past and birds do the same thing. And um, I got taught a very humbling uh, exercise in this. Uh, darner dragonflies, the big ones, the great big blue-eyed darner and the, the big ones are very fast. And uh, you know, when I was younger, I, I was a basketball player at Marietta, and I, I, I used to uh, convince myself I wasn't getting old by trying to dunk a basketball on my birthday every year, okay? So <laughs> I gave up on that about 37 or something. And then, then I was, I see if I can catch a darner dragonfly, you know? I'm still not old because I can still catch a darner dragonfly. So I'm by the uh, creek in Fort Collins, the ditch in Fort Collins, and this darner's flying up and down, and I'm trying to convince myself I'm still young. And it goes by, and I swing as best I can swing, and the dragonfly just goes up, and like, dude, what's your problem? Uh, <laughs> did you try to catch me? I, I, I saw something go by, but it wasn't much of a challenge. And so I, I did that two or three times. I didn't get the dragonfly, and this eastern kingbird was across the ditch flutters out, grabs the dragonfly, flies back up. <laughs> I'm like, what? The? How did he do that? Well, then I analyzed it, and he came out of the sun, just like, uh, I don't know, dogfighter, uh, uh, airplane pilots learn to come out of the sun when you're going after the Zero or the Messerschmitt. And, uh, he came out of the, you know, dragonflies can see not quite 360, they can see 330 or something, and he went, he came up from behind, out of the sun, and that's all it took, and I was swinging, you know, here comes the dragonfly, can see me, probably 5,000 of me, and I swing at it, and I was in the sun, he wasn't, and I was like, I see 5,000 people trying to catch me, and you think I'm not going to try to avoid that. Uh, so anyway, birds know how to do what they do very well. But all these common birds eat a lot of dragonflies. Uh, Mississippi kite down on the lower right is not a bird you're going to see in Glenwood or Aspen or Carbondale. But, you know, barn swallows and red-winged blackbirds and western kingbirds and eastern king they eat a lot of dragonflies. Um, this is a young uh, fall chestnut-sided warbler, which would be a very rare bird to see. And uh, nothing better than a rare bird to see a rare bird eating something that you can identify. And this one was eating a variegated meadowhawk dragonfly, which is kind of hard to see, but the arrow sort of points to the center of the dragonfly mess at this point in the uh, proceedings. But uh, a lot of birds, 
opportunity, that's another theme of bird food. They have a standard diet and then they are very opportunistic. So if a bird is used to eating wild grass seeds and it comes across you know, half a bushel of grain spilled on the highway, it's going to take advantage of that. And, you know, birds take advantage of a lot of things. This is a black pole warbler that's trying to get down this de-winged, pretty big dragonfly. And in the right picture, I mean, it was painful to watch this, trying to swallow that, you know, three-inch <laughs> body, and the bird's only five inches long. Uh, pretty tough, but they did, he did it. He wanted it bad enough. But all these things eat, I mean, common loons and herons and broadwing hawks. I mean, everything eats dragonflies on occasion. All these birds, snipe, burrowing owls, cardinals, flycatchers, tanagers. Here's the barrels golden eye that Dick Felby showed me today up uh, by Rudai Reservoir. Great blue herons, pie grebe, a lot of things. Uh, purple martins. But uh, you know, there are swellings that you see on plants that are called galls. So something, a mite, an insect, invades the plant. The plant, there's a highly evolved relationship between these, the, the organisms. The plant secretes special cells or creates a tumor around this invader which is actually better for the organism to live off of than regular tissue. And birds know that these swellings have something inside of them. They are pinatas waiting to be broken open. And there's food inside. You know, everybody's probably seen the far left thing, which is a, called the coolie gall aphid, and they occur all over every spruce tree in the state. There's some of these. And those break open, and inside the lower left, you can see all the little chambers with all the condominium dwellers inside. And birds know when these things open up, they know how to break them open. Uh, woodpeckers, chickadees, a lot of things. And if you start looking at plants in this area on a hike, you will see galls. If you walk along the, the Roaring Fork and you look at the willows, you'll see all kinds of galls on those willows. And if you're a chickadee, you know that each one of those is at the right season, has something inside of it. It's a Tootsie Roll Pop with a prize inside. Uh, uh, but the, this is a particular gall that occurs on oak, uh, bur oak especially, called a rough bullet gall. So in the center, that's kind of when these galls are, you know, the insect is inside there, this little wasp that makes these things is growing and developing and the galls look like grapes on this tree and then this is after one morning of a downy woodpecker chowdering that whole set of galls and removing every little larval wasp from inside those galls. I mean it looks totally different like the top got blown off of every one of those galls and the little center is a little chamber where the larva was and it's gone. So there's a woodpecker breaking into one of these galls on an oak tree and he's getting ready to whack it open and uh, you know they know if there's a hole in it it's empty you know that's an exit hole from the creature that made it so they don't go in they go into them right before they're going to emerge biggest bang for the peck right you know the biggest thing that's in you know the thing is too little a month ago and it's gone tomorrow and so if you can predict by looking at the gall which is what they're doing when they're just about to come out when they're ripe then that's when they go after them and uh, so there's I don't know if hackberry trees there are some hackberries on the west slope a little net leaf hackberry that I know is over by Slick Rock and stuff south of Grand Junction between there and Cortez but uh, there's, there are some little insects that are called psyllids, and that little black and white thing at the top row there is what a psyllid looks like. It looks like a very, very tiny cicada, and they make these bumps, or they're called nipple galls, on hackberry, and uh, birds love them. And they come to, they overwinter as adults in the bark. They fly up to the tree as the buds are beginning to swell in the spring prior to the leaves elongating from those buds. They lay their eggs, their kids develop all summer and make these galls on the leaves, and then they leave the galls in late summer, fall, 
and go to the bark and around the circle we go again. So they're coming to the, to the tree and they're leaving. They're coming to the buds and they're leaving the galls spring and fall during passer and bird migration. And migrant birds go right to these hackberry trees down you know, at lower elevation where I am. When I go birding in spring and fall, April, of May, and October, September, uh, I go to the hackberry trees, and that's where most of the rare birds are. And a lot of, a lot of amazing birds. I've seen 40 some species of birds eating these things. Um, but uh, they're very important to a lot of things. Uh, in the winter, creepers and chickadees and nuthatches are finding them under the bark, and then in migration, they're they're getting them when they're outside the gall, basically coming to the buds or leaving the galls, and they're actively flying adults. That's when birds are getting them. Uh, but but this, this picture shows two kinds of galls made by these little psyllid creatures, the nipple gall, the big bumps, and then those little purplish kind of rectangles. There's another kind that's in there. They both have similar life cycle. Uh, these are leaves that show those blister galls, and every one of them has been pecked by a chickadee. And I watch chickadees pull a leaf off that has these galls. They'll stand on it like it's a, a welcome mat, and then they'll just wail right through the middle of the galls. And the thing falls to the ground, you hold it up to the light, and the holes are right through the middle of those galled areas. And they're definitely getting them. Uh, you know, if you want to hire a good carpenter that will hit the nail every time, hire a chickadee that's wailing on these little uh, holes. But this is kind of the life cycle of, the, of these galls. And you can see, um, where's that pointer thing? Oh, I probably put it in my pocket or something. Reasonable. Uh, so there's number one up in the upper left is a, so th those are the galls with the insects inside fully formed. We pop one of those open and you can see the little individual nymph inside. Here's where there's a couple birds and squirrels that'll bite them off at that point, just like the woodpeckers were doing with that oak gall, and removing them. If they're allowed to complete their development, these are the holes on the other side of the leaf where they emerged. Here's a little emerged psyllid with his little uh, wing pads. If you've ever watched a moth come out of a cocoon, they're all wrinkly and kind of need to pump them up and dry them out. So that's kind of an early emerged psyllid. Here's a little bit later with his wings fully formed, then he gets hardened and dark, and that's the way they overwinter. And uh, they're very tiny. I mean, they're the size of an aphid. And uh, how does a bird ever make a living off that? Well, I watched one individual warbler at my lunch hour one time, estimated he was pecking 50 times a minute, came back at 5.30 after work, he was still in the same tree, still pecking at the same rate, and I calculated he ate 10,000 psyllids that afternoon. Uh, you know, if you can chicken pick in one spot for 20 of them, it's worth the effort for these little things. It's like me and a popcorn. It's well worth it. Uh, so there's a psyllid inside with his little orange wing pads beginning to grow. Pop the top off that nipple gall. Um, here's another type of psyllid that makes its gall on the petiole or the stalk of the leaf. And that's probably the kind you would see over at uh, Slick Rock or Uniweep Canyon. Uh, and this is a very rare warbler for Colorado, a Cape May warbler that was living for about 10 days on psyllids. And everybody came to see it. And it was all because of the psyllids. And I'm talking about the psyllids. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but there's a Cape May warbler. And I go, yeah. <laughs> but it's because of the psyllids, yeah, boys and girls. Uh, <laughs> And all these birds were eating psyllids, a northern perilla and a kinglet and the downy woodpeckers getting them out of the bark. Uh, I, I'm a big champion of these psyllids as being very important to uh, birds. If you see any bird in open water in the winter, whenever it is, and it's fly catching or it's getting some kind of little flying insect off, either floating on the surface or above the water, I would bet the majority of the time it's midges. So midges look like mosquitoes, but they don't bite you. Uh, they have real fancy antenna. I mean, that, that is an awesome antenna. That looks like an explosion, uh, like a fireworks. 
But they're, they're very, very important to birds, midges. And a lot of the larvae um, are down in the uh, bottom of the stream, but everybody's seen these things. The, the, they fly, hover over you in a big cloud. You can hear them whining. And they never land on you, they never bite you, but people flail at them and act like, oh, my, you know, and use a ton of insecticide. You don't have to just, just pretend like they're not there and keep walking and the birds will eat them. Um, but I pointed out in this picture every midge that I could see in the photo. Wow. And these are grebes and they're just going along getting them just like they're harvesting wheat. And uh, any body of water you look at, I'm, I'm sure you'll see this sooner or later. And they're, they're nitpicking for something small on the surface and I would bet they're midges when they do that. Uh, you know, bark beetles, I, I'm so glad I'm not here talking about mountain pine beetle. I talked about mountain pine beetle thousands of times in my life and it's so nice to talk about something else. But uh, mountain pine beetle, the pine beetle, uh, Douglas fir beetle, spruce beetle, they are major foods for forest birds, especially woodpeckers. And the downy woodpecker, hairy woodpecker, and three-toed woodpecker, uh, majority of their diet is these things or the wood boring beetles the big grubs that come in the next successional stage after the bark beetles is the wood boring beetles and uh, uh, you know this is the main natural control of pine beetle the the uh, natural check and balance they they can't prevent these big epidemics if the forest is old enough and dense enough and quote right for a cycle of pine beetle but they do a lot to kind of bring it to an end. And they, they you know, use the dead trees for nest trees. And uh, there's a very highly evolved relationship between woodpeckers and these four spark beetles. Um, you know, a typical forest succession as we've got a new forest, it grows up, it gets old, uh, crowded, it gets stressed. Sometimes that's climate, sometimes it's us that put in a subdivision and change drainages and impact, you know, septic systems and whatever. We stress that forest if we plunk a housing development in there. Uh, bark beetles or, the fi or fire are the responses to those stressed, old, dense forests. Uh, then we have wood borers and decay and then ants and more decay when the trees fall down. Uh, the carbon gets turned into new trees and we have a new forest and that may be at the high elevation spruce fir forest that's maybe a 300 year cycle uh, down in pinyon pine and lower ponderosa pine forest that's maybe 50 to 100 year cycle but it's very natural and it's to me it's fun to watch i understand if they're all the trees in your yard are dying that's maybe not cool and there's some things you can do, but that, that's a very typical scene if you look at, live in the mountains and look at them. And those are all bark beetle killed. This, in this case, it's uh, subalpine fir killed by the balsam bark beetle. But we saw a lot of dug fir beetle today uh, up by root eye. And, uh, you know, mountain pine beetle never was a big problem here. But even though they tried to say it was going to be in Aspen, and I, I went up there a few times and so that's not your problem. Forest fire is your problem. All those oak uh, understory around these uh, very valuable houses, that's, that's the issue. Not Pine beetle will never be around here what it is in Breckenridge and some of the things everybody was worried about. Um, but these are all bark beetles. They, you kind of tell them apart by looking at their back end. So if you're an entomologist, you're looking at beetle booties and trying to... <laughs> trying to figure them out. Nobody knows what you're doing. And, uh, but uh, they all have kind of a different back end and that's a big uh, feature in the key. But uh, they make these tracks and tunnels. The grubs are what the, the, the woodpeckers are eating and other birds. Uh, this is the next stage, these big wood boring beetles. Some of them are very big. You've probably all seen the ones on the left there with the big long antennae that land on you while you're camping or hiking in late summer and uh, the, the larvae of those are down there and if you're a woodpecker and you're looking for little bark beetle things and you pull the bark off and see a t-bone a big grub I mean it's a good morning and uh, uh, some of these wood borers are bigger than others uh, um, I, I'm a forest entomologist and I've been used to looking at insects and trees and I was tearing apart this old rotten log by Dolores 
you know, like a bear and the, the tree was so rotten, it was like angel food cake and I'm just kind of pulling it apart to see what's in there and this thing was in there. And it's the wood borer, the larva of the biggest uh, beetle in the state called a ponderous borer and it's a fairly big beetle and this larva was even bigger than that. And I got big hands and that, that was a big insect. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> you should know what this is, that's your job. And, um, anyway, I took it home with me, and the long story short, this, this beetle lived in my kitchen for five years. Um, I just took a big chunk of the, the tree it was in, and it lived in there, and I took it to the state fair, and little, <laughs> little girls, one little girl named my, my beetle Grubby, and then... <laughs> I was talking to somebody and I turned around and the little girl stole it, you know, and she and her grandmother t and went off with Grubby and I'm like, she really did like that beetle and later on she came back with her grandma and gave it back and uh, grandma didn't want to take it home. And, uh, but that, that beetle never made it through to an adult. I wanted to rear it through to adulthood, but I got a lot of mileage out of it in the meantime, showing people this beetle. And uh, it was my pet, basically, and my, you know, lived on Marie Callender fumes for five years. And, uh, uh, but I don't think it ever went through because I never subjected it to cold, which is apparently it needed a month outside or something to, to trigger the, the change. But, um, this is what woodpeckering on those kind of insects look like. So if you're walking through the forest and there's dead trees around and there's big chips and big bark flakes all over, the woodpeckers are trying to get down to where this prey is and they got to remove bark to get down to them. They're under the bark and in the outer layers of wood. Do they kill the trees then? Well, the, the tree is already dead oh, when okay. the wood borers get, the bark beetles killed it, then the lawyers come in, the, I call them lawyers because there there's probably five lawyers, ten lawyers in here. Um, the lawyers, I call them lawyers, the wood boring beetles, the next stage after bark beetles, I call them lawyers because they're at the scene of the accident, but they didn't do it, all right? <laughs> so, so when the wood borers are in there and when the woodpeckers are getting them out, the, you know, the tree's already dead at that point. So when you got firewood and you can hear that scrunching sound in your wood pile, that's wood borer larvae chewing on the wood, and they have metals in their mandibles to harden them and make it easy to chew wood. I mean, they got it all figured out. Um, but here's some more examples of woodpeckering, and each one of those holes in the middle of the orange areas where a wood borer was extracted by the, by, they can hear them, they can feel the vibrations, and they know kind of where to peck once they get sort of down to it. Uh, and this is, you know, an airplane. You can actually survey for bark beetle trees by looking for the bark on the snow in the winter. So you can see where the bottom blue arrow is, all that bark that's accumulated on the snow, that shows you woodpeckers have been in that tree and they're, so it's, you know, the spruce beetle, the needles fall off and it doesn't turn orange that you could identify from the air, but you can see the woodpeckering evidence on the snow and then, what do you think made the shadow in the top arrow? The plane. the plane, right, very good. I got that picture back and I'm like, Sasquatch is real. No, uh, uh, but these, you know, here's, here's woodpeckers with these big grubs in their beak and uh, the three-toed woodpeckers, the one with the yellow, these are all three-toed woodpeckers, but you could see that'd be a major score for a woodpecker. Uh, you know, here's a, Harry Woodpecker bringing home the bacon to his babies and they don't get asked what they want to eat for dinner, they just get it shoved uh, down their throat. And then the next stage is these carpenter ants. Carpenter ants and ants in general are a major food for birds, especially during the stage when they fly, they get wings and fly. Uh, all kinds of birds, cedar wax wings and sap suckers and everything eats them because they're slow and they're conspicuous. But ants make some pretty cool, I call that an Anasazi ant. That looks like a, you know, like a, a ruin down at Mesa Verde or something. But the ants don't eat the wood, they just excavate it and they feed somewhere else. Termites eat the wood, but ants just excavate semi-rotten wood. But, um, 
but the wing dance are the ones that are really food for birds especially. You know, flickers, when they are working on a lawn, they're getting ants. And so they're definitely an ant specialist. But uh, the flying ones are kind of fair game for everything. Uh, caterpillars have evolved with bird predation and they've, they've come up with a lot of tricks to avoid being eaten. Uh, tents and folding, you know, hiding inside their food with the leaf origami. Uh, the monarch tells you I am poisonous by the garish coloration. That's a common theme in nature. You go to the tropics and the, the poison dart fogs are bright blue and orange and they kind of warn you this aposomatic coloration tells you I am dangerous, don't eat me. And that's kind of what a monarch's doing. Uh, this distasteful, some caterpillars have hairs and spines. Uh, some are crypt cryptic, camouflage. Other ones get between the upper and lower layer of the leaf and mine around and tunnel and make that snake-like track. Um, so this middle picture shows one of those origami things opened up and there's the worm inside. And if you're an Oriole or you're a tanager and you just poke down in the middle of there and you know there's something in there. Um, this is a common moth. That picture, last time I was over here with Marion Shep, I saw those kind of moths all over their parking garage and their unit. And that tells me that that caterpillar is in the juniper or the pinion around here. And if you ever see a tent like that in the winter down here in a conifer, little uh, pinion or juniper, that's a tent of this particular tiger moth. And they're active in the winter, which is a strange thing. The caterpillars are there in the winter and they're all juiced up with ethylene glycol or glycols that antifreeze that suppress their freezing temperature. But they're so hairy, uh, most birds don't eat them because they're very uh, irritating. Um, Everybody knows the Miller moth. The Miller moths probably cause more problems on the front range than here. Uh, when they get to here, they're at their end destination. They're in these mountain meadows. They're at flowers, the moths. Uh, they migrate up and they migrate back to the prairie. Out on the prairie, they're a problem. They're called cutworms and they're a problem for a wheat farmer. And when they're migrating through, they drive everybody crazy. They cause car wrecks. Uh, Cats eat them, uh, but these millers, the very common moth in the eastern plains, are major food for birds. Uh, their bears eat them in Yellowstone. They're all grease, highly high energy, and uh, very important, even though they drive people nuts. Uh, Miller moths. Uh, there's the cutworms, highly useful to birds. And here's a. We had a big spring snowstorm on the eastern plains and I was seeing all the birds right along the edge of the road. And this metal, metal lark scored a cutworm from the, and then he tossed it down. He just threw back his beak and threw it up in the air just like my grandpa used to do really well with popcorn. Um, but this is a little uh, western wood peewee and it was a very cold day during migration and his tail was dragging literally had it in the water and he looked like he was just barely hanging on and um, he found highly uh, yellow jackets you probably noticed that yellow jackets are a pest maybe early in the summer and they're really a pest late in the summer that's when they really hassle your picnic go down your pepsi can uh, or your your uh, sports drink or whatever uh, they switch, and it's a typical guy thing. The, the only one that overwinters of a yellow jacket is the queen, and she needs to be fertilized before she goes into the winter, and all the males think they're going to be the one. And so they have a different diet in late summer where they really try to um, be, be fit and uh, energetic, and they feed on a lot of carbohydrates and sugars. And that's when they're causing you problems, and this very stressed peewee, I watched it eat this yellow jacket and that's probably really good nutrition because that thing was full of sugar because the yellow jackets eat a lot of aphids which are full of sugar and um, so I was intrigued that, that that's what the peewee chose as a kind of a desperado food on a cold uh, rainy day was a yellow jacket. But there he is munching down that yellow jacket. Um, everybody knows about shrikes. 
our grandparents called them butcher birds. They have, that's the only raptorial or predatory songbird in North America. They have hawk-like beaks and very wimpy feet. So they stick their food on things to hold them. And uh, we have the loggerhead shrike on the left in the summer and the uh, northern shrike in the winter. Probably here you mostly just see northern shrikes in the winter, I would guess. But uh, they're amazing birds, and uh, they have learned to adapt. Uh, one of the best things they can stick something on is um, barbed wire instead of, in the old days, sticks or whatever. And um, I get intrigued with trying to figure out what they stick on things out on the eastern plains. And this grasshopper is their most common thing that they stick on barbed wire is this red shank grasshopper. It has these red, bright red back legs. But uh, all this stuff I found impaled by shrikes. And uh, um, there's one there's one shrike last summer that I called the Charles Manson of all shrikes. And <laughs> I mean, he was sticking everything. And uh, that brewer sparrow head at the bottom just blew my mind. I'm going along photographing each object and I go, whoa, that's a head. Uh, and the amazing thing about this shrike was in one tree in the middle of the prairie, no other trees around, his impaling objects was about 100 feet on either side of that tree, 100 yards. At one end of the territory was the head. At the other end of the territory was the headless body. So the literature says that these things impale because they have weak feet and that they're using them as a fork. The other reason they do it is the males arrive on territory, impale a bunch of stuff, and show off for females of what a good provider they are. And the females pick their mate based on how good of stuff they've got stuck around. And then, then they eat all that stuff. And I, I think there might be a third reason, and that is just pure intimidation. Like, don't even think about nesting near me. You know, I will kill you. I will rip your head off. I will kill your babies. I will. Just don't compete with me. Just don't mess with me. I am a headhunter in Borneo, and don't come in this piece of jungle, you know. Uh, so, I mean, that, that baby bird in the middle, is they got that out of a nest. That, that, that doesn't even have any feathers yet. And so I, the, the brewer sparrow is a little sparrow, chipping sparrow size, you know, that long. So that, the shrike is the size of a starling. Uh, it's not not super big, no. But I mean, they're vicious. And the one thing I want to see is a rattlesnake impaled, and I think I'm going to see that eventually, a baby rattlesnake by shrike, yeah. I mean, that snake on the left is a, a garter snake, but I've seen hognose snakes. I've seen snakes about that long impaled, and I, you know, I think they could take a baby rattlesnake. Um, they have a notch in their beak, and the, the notch is designed to sever the spinal cord or whatever they bite. And uh, if they snuck up on a rattlesnake, they could get it. Um, aphids, a major food for birds. Uh, you know, these are all aphids in the wing stage. Uh, you know, they're attended by the yellow jacket, and that's why that yellow jacket was good food, because they've eaten the sugar and all those aphids. Uh, um, and this is a black pole warbler that stayed in one tree in Boulder for a long period of time, and it was strictly eating aphids for uh, a long time, and it was in December, you know, so it was surviving on aphids, lots of them. Um, you know, chickadees get them, and you can see the, ch the aphids stuck on the bill, and um, this is a Tennessee warbler that was over in Fort Collins. And I watched that bird for six days straight, more time than I want to admit that I spent with that one bird. <laughs> I wanted to figure out how was it surviving, and it was around Thanksgiving last year, and it was eating aphids in Viburnum and European Beach. And I watched this bird eat for six days, and I swear it swelled. I mean, it put on weight. And it, it, it got so big, I thought it was going to pop. I mean, it, it had cleavage by the time it was done. I mean. This, this bird was fueling up on aphids, and it took off the day before we had a big snowstorm, and hopefully it made it. But um, you probably know about sapsuckers, a particular type of woodpecker. There's three of them. 
three species and they peck on live trees, make those trees bleed, and then they drink the sap. And they do so in an interesting way. They make this tic-tac-toe kind of look, it's very ordered, but, but there's live, live tissue in between the rows. They're not killing the tree, they're not girdling it. They want it to keep flowing. This is their, this is their faucet. So they want to drink from it without killing it, and they do a very good job of it. Um, this is the way it, it starts out. Um, so they start a simple peck mark and it bleeds. And, uh, and then when it clogs up, they rework it and make it a little bigger and get it flowing again. They work the top edge of the peck. And uh, so here's how it starts out. And then they begin to enlarge them. And you can see in this picture, if you look at that square area that I highlighted, if we look at that blown up, you can see those little annulations in there, and that's how many times that bird has enlarged that peck to keep it going. And so that one's 13 times, probably 10 days apart, it worked that hole over the period of its several month uh, presence on that site. But uh, so those are all enlarged sap sucker, and you probably all have seen this if you, when you walk in the forest. Um, alders and birch down along the rivers are highly used in the summer by the red nape sapsucker. But uh, so it's sort of like the little red hen and uh, the sapsuckers make the holes and then all these other, who will help me make the holes and uh, all these other things drink from that sap that the, other, that the woodpeckers have provided. And they, they put some cameras on sapsucker holes up at Gothic and it's amazing what was, you know, bobcats were drinking. Butterflies, hummingbirds, they think hummingbirds time their migration to follow the migration of sapsuckers and they're plugging in on those holes like gas stations. Um, amazing, flies all over. Everything's drinking from these sap wells. Hummingbirds, major drinker from these sap wells. Uh, and sometimes they actually vector diseases. Uh, they got some fun, fungal spores on their beak and they peck on a bark and they actually transfer a few diseases, but this is rare that they ever cause any more than a physical injury that heals over when the woodpecker leaves. Um, uh, one of my favorite groups are the crossbills. They've got that crazy beak that they use. They pry open the scales of a cone, reach in with their tongue and pull the seed out that's in between those scales. 3,000 a day, that's, that's your job, is to get 3,000 seeds out of cones with that beak and a sticky pine cone or a sticky spruce cone. But there are the seeds that are inside those scales of two different kinds of spruce trees. And uh, you know, so here are the seeds of a pine. There's a crossbill with a seed stuck to his beak to <laughs> prove that's what he's going after. Uh, this is a famous white wing crossbill pair that spent one uh, spring in Fort Collins and everybody came to see him. They need to drink a lot of water when you're eating cereal all day, dry seeds. You need to really complement that with a bunch of water. And they come down and they eat snow that's caught up in the branches or they come down to the ground and get snow. So they're eating a lot of, of snow, a lot of water in the winter. 20% uh, of their body weight a day they drink. So uh, for me and Shep, that's six gallons of water a day four gallons is lethal to humans, I looked up on the internet, so they would drink you under the table, literally. Uh, you'd be dead before you could keep up with them. They drink a lot of water. Huh? Uh, but they eat other things, and these are all foods that I've seen crossbills eat. Scales and caterpillars and seeds from birch. And uh, So here's the development of a Douglas fir bud through bud break in the spring, you know, starts like a tight bud, ends up as a, you know, new burst of new needles. Uh, this stage right here, where the bud cap is still on, uh, is really useful to birds. And that thing I talked about with defect or abnormal, if the whole forest looks like this on the right, except for a few like in the middle where the bud cap didn't come off, Birds key right in on those ones with the bud cap still on and they find the worm inside there that ate some of the foliage so that it didn't swell enough to pop that bud cap off. So here's, here's a, a crossbill female pulling 
budworms out of those ones with the cap still on, and they were going right to the ones with the cap still on because that's where, and we, we saw that last year on our field trip up, uh, hiking up to the uh, Maroon Bells Wilderness out of Redstone. Uh, they were keying in on those ones with the cap still on, and that's where the larvae were because they had eaten half of the foliage that is necessary to expand and pop those caps off when there's not enough foliage in there that they stay on. And the birds know that's because there's a worm in there. Uh, coarse berries, that's an easy thing for us to see birds eat. And uh, I guess I'm, my message about this is we should be sh sure to eat. Uh, well, we're running out of time, I see. Okay, I see somebody. Either you're doing gymnastics or I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, we got to make sure we landscape our properties with berries that are good for them. There's berries that are colorful and neat for our properties, but maybe like landscaping with Doritos. You know, they're not particularly good for birds. They eat a lot of them. It takes more feeding to get nu nutrition. They're out in the open. A sharp gen hawk picks them off more because they're trying to make haste with, with something that isn't very good for them. But, so use native plants when you're landscaping. Uh, this, this is a, you know, high bush cranberry, bittersweet. Those are not particularly good for birds and a lot of people use them, but uh, this is European buckthorn. It, the species name is Cathartica. What does that tell you? <laughs> They're gross, but birds will eat them. They'll barf, they, you know, they'll have diarrhea that they, they still eat them. Here's a prothonotary warbler, a bird birds would, you know, lust to see, but but it, you know, it's it's a desperado when it's eating those. Uh, here it is eating a, a buckthorn berry, but not good for it particularly. Uh, pondweed is a plant that's common. You see a bird go down and come up with a mouthful of salad. It's eating. Got a meat, uh, put a magetin. Uh, there's several species. And these little scuds hide in that stuff, and some birds are eating those little animals that live in the pondweed too. But um, prairie dogs, big food for a lot of hawks, especially ferruginous. Uh, voles, big food for hawks in the winter. This little kestrel eats grasshoppers all summer, and the ones you see here in the valley in the winter are eating voles. The fat mice with little ears and short tails. That's a vole, uh, as opposed to the deer mice that have big ears and long tail. Church mouth. Uh, crayfish, major food for birds. And we were wondering today, Dick and I, if there's crayfish in the, these rivers here. I, I, I think that's a major food for these diving, like golden eyes, um, mergansers. Um, all these birds trying to get down that thing. And a lot of them, if it's a big enough one, they'll remove the claws first. If they eat it with the claws on, they'll eat it tail first so that the claws are kind of flowing right, you know, it's not good to eat it claw first. They always eat them tail first if, if they leave the claws on. Uh, worms, almost all the worms we have are exotics brought here from Europe in plant material. But, you know, what did robins do before earthworms? I don't know. Uh, but there's a bird in Fort Collins right now that's a big worm eater and it's this woodcock. And I had never seen them since I lived in Ohio. And the first woodcock I ever saw in Colorado was this one at Bobcat Ridge near Loveland. And uh, I kept watching it and watching it and watching it. I never saw it come up with a worm. And so after it left last year, I got in there and uh, went, got some buckets of that muck that it was probing in and just went through it and found all the things that were in there. And all this stuff was in there. And I think it was eating some other things like snails and then those kind of aquatic roly polies there in the middle upper part. And these little things on the bottom, I don't think were big enough for that bird to be really eating or detecting with its bill. But I think those uh, scales, uh, when you see a bunch of birds in fish uh, in a water swarming around one particular area of a reservoir, they're getting probably this fish, the gizzard chat, a little tiny great food fish. Uh, here's a turkey vulture. Uh, <laughs> Thank goodness for turkey vultures. They eat all the dead roadkill, and uh, they don't have a very interesting diet, but um, it wouldn't have worked at the Woody Creek Tavern, uh, Shep. Uh, 
But anyway, I think this stuff is fun and figure out some food stuff that's going on in your own yard. Uh, here's a thing I saw, up, you know, in high mountain lake. Looked like barf. I mean, it looked like dog barf or something. And I, I saw a bird go down there and eat it. And it was a gray jay. And it turns out that's a fungus called dog vomit slime mold, which is a uh, great name for it. And I didn't know gray jays ate it, but they do. Uh, what do you think uh, my buddy Dwayne saw eat one of these, a junco, out on the eastern plains of southeast Colorado? A roadrunner. Yep. Uh, what do you think uh, one of these uh, photo videographers, wildlife videographers, filmed a particular nest of a bird, and these were coming in right and left, delivered to the babies. What do you think it was? Pig meow. Amazing. Um, this is a, a centipede called a house centipede that me and my buddies at CSU, who've got almost 100 years of experience, never knew occurred outdoors. They're always coming from houses. This, this canyon wren brought 23 of those to its babies in one morning and was obviously getting them outdoors somewhere in the uh, rocks of a dam. Uh, what's that? Poison ivy. And I was just down in Arizona and watched this beautiful hepatic tanager eating poison ivy berries. And I hope it doesn't itch. Um, so these are, this is, these are the things I've written about in this column, The Hungry Bird. If you're interested, you can maybe see it online if you go to the Colorado Field Ornithologist site. Uh, last one. What is that brown stuff on the bill of this magpie? Um, <laughs> Those are some, some of the things I thought about. It was that. Somebody had left a, actually a simple, simply caramel Milky Way on the fence post and he was getting that. So anyway, thank you for coming tonight and I uh, appreciate it. It looks like some questions, right? Okay, yeah, sure. Before you leave, um, David's willing to take some questions. Um, also, before you leave, I want to make sure he also brought a handout that you, there's mo many of them by the door to grab before you leave. But if we have some questions, we actually need to use this microphone for the grassroots TV, even though it doesn't project your voice at all. So if you have a question, I'll bring the mic to you. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. This, I'm not sure, is exactly about what birds eat. But I have seen birds often do a behavior where they wipe their bills. Oh. What, what's going on okay. in multiple um, different species? I guess the behavioral ecologists would call that maintenance. And in a lot of cases, the two things that I've seen them getting rid of is conifer resin or silk, like these tent caterpillars. I've watched an Oriole one time look and look and see this bag full of worms and finally plunged in there and got a couple of them and then spent 10 minutes wiping all the, the silk off. So spider webs would be something they'd need to clean off. Uh, birds that probe in the mud to get a worm or a beetle grub or something, they'll try to get rid of the little rocks and mud. Um, it's a maintenance activity and there's probably something that got on their beak, maybe they're even preening and they get some feathers stuck to a wet part of their mouth and they're getting those off, but it's, it's a maintenance activity that there's something on there they wanna clean off and it, it's usually related to a food episode, but it could be from you know fixing up their feathers too. Uh, that'd be my guess for most of that. Yes, ma'am. I've observed that in my backyard feeder because I feed the Oh. I feed the birds peanut butter. Oh. Dick has a question back there. Sorry. Oh, you got the mic. Sorry, we'll get to you. I'm sorry. I have a question. Um, Russian olives, non-native introduced species. What quality food do they offer? Are they in the low quality food? Or just, just about the quality of the food? I'd say they're intermediate. You know, the pulp, I've eaten it, the pulp around the little pit is not bad. I mean, it's like a weak, 
weak watermelon, it's not too bad. Uh, I don't think it's the best, and I get in trouble for talking about all the rare birds I've seen in Russian olive and that they're not completely evil. And you know, what I see is a lot of activities on the front range where every county and city open space department at some point it becomes their mission to get rid of Russian olive and they do a lot of shock and awe and they get 80% of them and leave 20% of them and don't replace them with something better. And I get in trouble for saying, you know, if that's, what, if that's the way you're gonna do it, yeah. don't even mess with it because you dumbed it down for several years. It grows back anyway. Uh, and you know, if you don't have the money and the time to replace them with uh, cottonwoods and willows that are better and water them to get them established and truly replace the Russian olive completely, eradicate it, don't do it. You know, it's sort of like, I don't know, I'm going to get myself in trouble again, but um, <laughs> just do it right. Just do it right or don't do it at all. That's what I'm saying. And because Russian olive is very valuable to a lot of birds. I've seen long-eared owls roosting in thickets. You go to the Lamar Community College woods and every nest of a cardinal or yellow-billed cuckoo I've seen is in a Russian olive thicket. And I imagine the density and the gnarliness of those thickets, the thorns, I mean, it's probably protective, plus it's food. And so there's a lot, and I say there's 60% bad and 40% good. So that's an intermediate, way better than tamarisk, I'll put it that way. Yes, sir. Uh, we go through 40 pounds of bird seed a week. Uh huh. And it, it seems like most of it's going down the throats of collared doves. Is there anything we can do about that? Uh, <laughs> Dick, Dick has a. You, what do you do? You put the netting. Four by two fence wire. You put four by two, make a cage of four by two fence wire. Yeah. And just put it over your feeder. The collared but, doves will not. Penetrate that four by two. Most the, the little birds will go. Little birds will go through. I mean, my my lady friend feeds safflower, which a lot of birds, undesirable birds, don't eat. I mean, I'm not going to say you'll never see a collared dove eat safflower, but uh, you know, you'll get sunflower seeds. Everything likes that, and uh, safflower is maybe hard to get over here. I don't know, but. It, it'll feed more of what you want to feed than, I mean, sunflower seed's a great one, and either you got to exclude the bad ones physically or pick a different food that is less desirable. The, the, the sharps and hawks don't seem to get those birds, they get the little Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, bigger hawks, cooper hawk and goss hawk, and they'll get the doves, but there's not enough of them, I'm sorry. Probably. Big ones with the black slash on the back. I mean, they're like in between a pigeon and a morning dove, okay. size wise. So probably the Russian dove. European collar dove is the correct name for that. There, there's a ring turtle dove, is the one everybody lets go at. They probably get let go at weddings in Aspen, I guarantee it. But they're, <laughs> they're pure white and they're the peace dove, you know. Uh, but if they're gray and bigger than a regular morning dove, it's a Eurasian collared dove, which locally get, is called Russian, <coughs> Russian doves. But Eurasian collared dove is the proper name for that bird. And they are, first one showed up in Colorado in 1992. And in three years ago, Fort Collins had the most Eurasian collared doves of any Christmas count in the United States, over 3,000 of them. I mean, you talk about a bird that figured out how to get here and make hay. <laughs> they reproduce year-round. They have six, six broods a year. I've seen babies in the snow in January. I mean, they're cranking out broods <laughs> constantly. We have, how about any, one more question, anybody? Well, thanks so much for coming. If you have any other questions, I know David will stick around and answer them. Sure. And, um, do thanks for coming. Do remember, again, that this is put on by the Roaring Fork Audubon and Wilderness Workshop and the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, so all of which are membership organizations. So thanks for joining us as you can. Thank you.